All right. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Barry Franklin. I represent Mr. Mapes, the appellant. I'd like to reserve five minutes uh, for rebuttal. Uh, may it please the court, uh, as you know from reading the record below in the briefs, this is a pretty, I think, straightforward, uh, limited to equitable distribution set of issues as a result of a final judgment of dissolution of marriage that was entered between the parties. Admittedly, it's a short-term marriage, uh, but as the court uh, presumably knows from reading the briefs and otherwise, uh, the duration of the marriage is not a super factor. It is not dispositive. It is one of a number of factors. And in this case, what occurred was, and there's no dispute in the answer brief, in all the years I've been doing this, I've never seen an equitable distribution where 97% of the marital assets go to one spouse and the other spouse gets 3%. I don't care if it's a two-year marriage or a 20-year marriage. That is absolutely, as a matter of law, based upon all of the cases. And frankly, there are a number of cases that are cited in the answer brief where unequal distributions were reversed. I think it's important to, and I don't like reading when I do oral arguments, but this quote I think is most telling from the Rodriguez case from the third district. I believe the law in the second district, as well as all of the districts, is consistent and directly on point. The third said, and this is when uh, they were identifying when is it appropriate to have an unequal equitable distribution. And again, most of the cases if it's permitted, if you have the justification, the findings going over all the statutory factors, 60-40, maybe worst case scenario, uh, one side gets shortchanged with 30% as opposed to 50%. This is what the third said. The unequal distribution of marital assets or debts is allowed when one party's conduct has caused the dissipation of assets or has otherwise adversely affected the financial status of the other party at a time, this is important here, at a time when the marriage is undergoing an irreconcilable breakdown. Okay, in both the assets that are at issue here, there are two assets, and I think what makes it easier for appellate review, both these assets were in joint names. There is nothing in this record that militates against the voluntariness and the actual agreement. In fact, the other side says in their answer brief, it's harmless error. It's not harmless error, it's quite the opposite. Uh, what the court did was sort of the snowball going down the hill with one problem after another after another. The apparent one singular, well two I should say, two reasons to justify 97% in favor of one party, and again, not controverted in the answer brief, and 3% in favor of uh, my client, the husband in this case, duration of the marriage, and both those assets were acquired in joint names, not when the marriage was in the process of an irreconcilable breakdown. It was months before they even separated, let alone well, let a petition ask, for dissolution of marriage being filed. Let me ask you this, Mr. Franklin. Sure. As I read the final judgment, you get this picture of the wife being in good shape financially. She had her home on Treasure Island. She had her duplex. Um, she was doing well. She could, she could survive. Um, the husband comes into the picture, and then and he has he brings minimal assets. Uh, he quits apparently quits working, and then this very, very convoluted series of transfers of money, um, purchases of, of different dwellings occurs. Uh, and when you get to the end of it, uh, and it's a relatively short, I mean, you go up to Beverly Hills, and you go to Lake County. Uh, when you get to the end of it, 50% of what the wife had is gone. She's no longer in good shape, uh, and all this seems to be orchestrated and and done by the husband. Uh, why why aren't 
those facts as outlined in the final judgment a sufficient basis for the trial judge to do what he did here. That's, I think, the issue. I was going to say, when I said the two justifications, in quotes, duration of the marriage, the other one was, to pick up on that comment and that question to me, to try to restore these two people back to where they were at the time of their marriage. Now, I challenge anyone to look in the specific statutory factors and tell me if it exists there. It doesn't. And the reason why it doesn't exist there, just think about that for a moment. And I think there's a gender, I don't want to use the word biasness, but if the roles were reversed here and you had the traditional, at least old style, relationship where the man made all of the money, she married somebody that she knew was not as economically well off as herself. These two people had been married for multiple, multiple times. They could have avoided their aggravation and the litigation that occurred by having a premarital agreement. They didn't do that. They should have, I'm sure, in retrospect. Certainly my client would have been better off if he had negotiated a fair agreement. But the answer to the question is, there is not and there should not be, and this would set a dangerous precedent to say, okay, keeping in mind to answer the question further, there's no fraud here. The other side tries to paint it in a different picture and sitting in the back of the room listening to the other oral arguments. This isn't penetration. This isn't, you know, you can shape it any way you want, but it's not fraud. It's not dissipation. There is testimony in this record that she agreed to each and every one. But there's also findings in the judgment where the court said the husband pushed her into doing these things. She didn't understand everything. Next thing you know, there's a loan on there. I mean, that's the equivalent of fraud. I mean, it's almost like what the judge did in this case, and I know you think it's probably unusual, if not inappropriate, was a de facto annulment to try and restore the parties to the status quo to make up for this chicanery, for lack of a better term. I mean, the judge went out of his way. He's got a long-time experienced trial judge that's seen a lot, 20-something year judge, if I remember his CV. So it wasn't a judge who did this lightly, but he's trying to work equity, and divorce is an equitable proceeding. So he's factoring all this in, and kind of like what Judge Wallace is saying is, why could these things not legitimately be a factor? If you look at the bare naked title alone, then you're 100% right. But he was going behind that to try and do equity. And if he got it wrong, then you've got to tell me why he abused his discretion to do these things. And I've got a question. Was the trial court not permitted to take into consideration her mental health? Well, I think certainly. It seems throughout that he gives considerable weight to her mental status. I think that's a factor. You're not going to hear me say otherwise, and I didn't say otherwise in the brief. But I think I've got to take one question at a time. The question about, you know, why is this not an abuse of discretion? First of all, it's a de novo standard if you're making clear legal errors. Where in the four corners of that final judgment is there the identity of marital assets versus non-marital assets? When you don't do that, and that's not harmless error here, that is per se reversible error. When you don't make when you just ask you on that issue, because let's say we accept that as legally correct. What's the remedy you seek to send it back for further findings? I mean, you could get the same results, if not a worse result or possibly a better result. I wanted to finish my if I can respectfully. Can I finish my answer to the other question? The once you have jointly held property, and this is the quintessential tenants by the entirety real estate. There was no action to rescind the deed. There was no fraud. There wasn't even dissipation argued. And to say that you got pushed, you know, anybody that's been married for a long time, you push your wife to do something. It turns it, you know, you're either the hero or, you know, maybe you're not the hero in marriages even that stay together. That's not a standard. That's not in any of the cases. More importantly, when you look at 61075, 
And I didn't say this in the brief, and maybe I should have, but it, and, and one of the cases came up, and I'll do a formal notice of supplemental authority. You look at 61075, we did away with special equities. That is, by express provision in 61075, abolished. Had it been the law years ago when things were different, we would have used the land day formula. That would have. I understand. The judge didn't do that. But the second thing is, the burden on the person that is seeking to overcome the presumption of marital. Here you have, and it shouldn't matter what the consideration is, and that's why the burden of proof is clear and convincing evidence. And again, go back to the gender um, issue here. If this was the standard you know, husband who's got the money, marries the woman that comes into the marriage, no prenup, with very little in the way of uh, marital assets or liability, that person, if the same result had occurred with a role gender reversal, would be arguing, and rightfully so, that that just isn't fair. It's not equitable. Remember the, the genesis, Canacris, the first case that brought equitable distribution to the state by judicial fiat before we had an equitable distribution statute. People don't realize Mrs. Canacris only got 23% of the marital assets. The law evolved to say after that, you start with a presumption of equal. Then the statute got changed, and we referenced this in the brief, the statute got changed to, to talk about how strong a legal presumption that is, how difficult it is to overcome that. And to say here, you know, it looks like he was a little tricky or he's moving accounts here or there, he made contributions to each one of those properties. She could have chosen to handle the situation on a factually different basis. And if the judge wanted to make an unequal... In, in all of these things, he was the prime mover, and, and he was the one that went out and made all these uh, improvements to the properties that were then sold and, and eventually sold at a loss. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's, it per, it's pervasive, I guess. But so is it that way in a lot of marriages. If you have a dominant male figure in a, in a traditional leave it to beaver kind of family, the husband makes, uh, you know, we're laughing, but there are still families out there where the husband makes the decisions, the wife goes along with it. It's certainly not dissipation just because the real estate market changes. And again, I submit that, you know, part of this is the abuse of discretion standard, but most of it is clear legal error. If you go over... I mean, are you really saying this is a leave it to be the family here? No, I'm saying, I'm saying that there are relationships because there is evidence in the record, that, and, and they point it, point it out in the answer brief, that she didn't want to confront him. She went along with it. You know, she didn't have to sign whatever that was, the Homeowners Association contract. She put her name on that, knowing full well that her husband's name was on it. So, and, and even if unequal equitable distribution could be justified here, is it justified to the point where she gets 97% of the assets? There's not a case out there where you have a similar set of facts without a showing of dissipation, because the judge didn't make any findings of dissipation. You know, I don't want to uh, forget the argument, the last argument, uh, which is, you know, the Berg Perlo in two cases from the second district, um, both Bishop and Walker, in a situation like this. As a matter of fact, uh, Judge Wallace, if you look at the last exchange in the record, I wasn't the trial attorney, but whoever was representing uh, the wife at that time at the trial court, because you have two different appellate lawyers in the case, there was some interesting discourse between the judge and the lawyer. And the discourse indicated, in reading it just from a cold transcript, the judge was, uh, it seemed to me, respectfully, that you mean to tell me there's a case that says unequal? The judge even made the comment, of, unequal is not really what we're talking about here, uh, although he did get that you know, small token uh, joint stock account. It mean, it, what you really mean is you have cases that say that he gets nothing and she gets everything. And there were a few case sites 
were case names that were bantered about and given to the trial judge. Not one of them, not one of them supports the wife's position as it has been articulated in the answer brief, where the way it was discussed at the trial court level, the judge didn't make any findings, and that's part of the problem with the presentation of proposed final judgments. I mean, you can look at that another way, and you can look at it as the trial judge is doing his own thinking and sort of sharply questioned the lawyer for the wife about the position that he was advocating and the cases that he was relying on, and it seemed to indicate to me that he was thinking very seriously about the situation and the argument that was made. I'm sure he was thinking about it because it was definitely a function of their opening and their closing, so it was certainly before the court. I don't think that is terribly relevant. There was no mention as to rebutting the presumption. Where did all of those cases go? I mean, there are four minutes, by the way. You can keep going or... Well, no, I think I'm going to stop, but just to not leave that dangling. Every one of the cases and the statute itself, and the reason why it's such a high burden is to avoid this kind of thing. She had a choice. Her choice was she could have insisted that that property be put into her name alone. She had another choice, too. When she did that, didn't the husband say, give me 80 grand before I do that? And the wife's answer brief says that she was going to provide him with a life estate. It never went into a trust. That was another choice. If that was, as the third district articulated in the Rodriguez case, if that was during the irreconcilable breakdown of their marital relationship, then she should have filed for divorce at that point in time. But she didn't. And this is not a question of fact. I don't want to get hung up on abuse of discretion standard and all the things that I know or should know about, you know, the final judgment comes to this court clothed with a presumption of correctness and not substituting, you know, decision and avoiding speculation. There was a very clear high, as it should be, burden of proof. It wasn't even discussed in that final judgment. Wife's lawyer, and for understandable reasons, but not legally sufficient reasons, wants to restore her client as best she can to the position she occupied at the beginning of the marriage. Are we going to do that when people lose money in the stock market or one decides to invest in a piece of real estate and the next thing you know, the market goes south? It shouldn't be like that. There are compelling, oh, I don't think I answered the question of what should be done down below. I think you can handle it two ways. The cheaper way, which would be appropriate based upon a lot of the case law, is that it can be reversed with specific instructions to remand for an equal distribution based upon the law. She didn't prove anything by clear and convincing evidence. It wasn't even raised. So I don't think you necessarily get a do-over. And the reason why that is a fair result is because there's no dispute, factual dispute, on the values of the two jointly owned assets, the escrowed monies and the Fort Myers property. I'll save the rest for rebuttal. Thank you. Well, whatever I've got, I'll probably have to use it. I'll save it for you. Okay, thank you. All right. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Colleen McAllister. I'm from Naples, Florida, and I represent the appellee here, Pat Mapes. Pat Mapes contends that the trial judge did not abuse his discretion in finding that under the unique circumstances of this case, there was a justification for unequal distribution. We also contend that the final judgment entered by Judge Carlin was compliant. What was the exact justification that the court found? Well, I think there were a number of justifications. Contrary to- Did the court actually find a justification, or we have to piece it together by reading the judgment? I'm not going to sit here and say that the final judgment is perfect. Would that they were all perfect. But I'm going to say that the final judgment clearly put this court, and I can tell just from the questions that were asked, this court on notice of what its thinking was in how it distributed the property. And I think that's what the statute requires. The statute says that you have to put the parties and the reviewing court on notice of what you considered in making an unequal distribution. 
And I think the court clearly, the short-term marriage was disposed of in a sentence. And the notion that the, the whole order was relied on the short-term marriage is, is simply not true. Uh, a 9 to 11 year marriage is in the gray area of short term. This was short, short term marriage. Um, I think that the judge focused on the enormous disparity of the contributions made by the parties, specifically said. She came in with $864,000 in real estate properties and he came in with $18,900. I might add that Mr. Uh, I might add that he, counsel said this is just the shape of marriage as well. That, is that relevant when you commingle assets thereafter? Yes, it is, Your Honor. Whether, whether they are commingled or gifted, the court can still look at them and decide whether they should be equitably distributed. Distributed, sorry. Um, I think maybe the most important factor in this case was the issue of windfall to, to Roy Mapes. The court clearly stated, if I equally distribute this property, this is what happens. And this court has said in Roth v. Roth that providing uh, a windfall to one spouse versus the other is also an abuse of discretion. Yeah. And you said in Figure, no one should pass from misfortune to prosperity. Similarly, no one should pass from prosperity to misfortune. Do you want to comment on the gender argument? Yes, I do. I absolutely do want to comment. I would point this court to McMonagle versus McMonagle. McMonagle is maybe the case closest to this in terms of facts. In McMonagle, it was a short-term marriage, less than two years. The parties were both over 56 years of age. Here, the parties were both over 65 years of age. It was at least a second marriage for both of the parties. All the assets the parties had were required prior to the marriage, and neither made any substantial contributions to the, to the other's income or assets during the marriage. In that case, the husband came in with all the assets, and the husband put the wife's name on the home and a rather large CD. And the court in its order said, I'm sorry, but I have to find that he did this and he gifted these assets to the marriage. And so therefore, under the statute, under 61075, I have to equally distribute. The appellate court said, first of all, the appellate court said, nothing compels under chapter 61075, nothing compels equitable distribution of assets, even if they're gifted. That it may be a starting point, but it doesn't have to be the ending point. The court specifically noted, court said, wife was far less generous in this case, having retained the sole interest in her premarital assets, except for this $13,500 $13, Scott trade account that Mr. Mapes purchased ostensibly because you know, he wanted to preserve some money. Um, which he admitted had a pass was password protected and, and on his computer, and he was the only one that could get access to it. Um, except for that, he contributed nothing to the marriage other than paying his share of bills. Oh, and the thirty-seven thousand dollars that he put in trees and shrubs and dirt for the house that he insisted they sell at a forty-three thousand nine hundred dollar loss because it was too cold for him. Um, what I'm what I'm saying is that the court in McMonagle turned the tide and took these same facts but with a man and said, you don't have to equitably distribute. All you have to do is justify under the factors in the marriage. And it said, this case presents compelling circumstances for unequal distribution of the marital assets. And if you look through the case law, both this court's case law and the other district court case law, what you see is that unequal distribution really does require some, some kind of unique circumstances. I think the other thing the court focused on in, in its um, final judgment was the economic circumstances of the parties at this point in time. And while, and, and let me remind the court, there is absolutely no dispute that Pat Mapes' premarital assets purchased both of the assets that were at issue and, and subject to distribution. No dispute that it was her money that purchased both of them. Um, but. What he specifically said in there was she came into the marriage with $4,300 a month in income. Her own testimony was she was comfortable. She was comfortable on $4,300 a month. Within five months of the marriage, her income had re been reduced by $1,700, and within a year, it had been reduced by another $500 down to $2,100 a month. And I think the court found that, you know, that is a permanent situation for her. 
So I think that was a factor in addition to all the equities and fairness of the parties. And, and the judge, even in the trial transcript, um, trial counsel asked Mrs. Mapes, would well, you think it's fair that he should get something? And she said, no, I don't. It was my money. You know, even when he complained that I spent money, it was my money that I was spending. And you ask, let me, let me try to cover some of these other things. Clear and convincing evidence. Well, the clear and convincing evidence before the court, and I might add that um, Mr. Mapes' counsel even objected to the forensic accountant testifying because she claimed it was redundant testimony. But there was clear and convincing evidence of who brought the money in and where the money went. And it was backed up by a, a thorough forensic tracing analysis and all the documentation. Uh, we touched briefly on the contributions of the parties. Let's look at the contributions of the parties to this marriage. You know, not only did her properties disappear and her income disappear, but during the course of the marriage, she testified, and there was no rebuttal testimony, that she spent $188,000 on bills and, 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 and her visa cards, and she claimed they put all their food, all their travel, all their gas, et cetera, on the visa bill. The best he could do, and, and I'm not even going to go into all the, the picking away at the totals on these bills, the best he could do is I contributed $84,000. So even if we look at what these parties spent, once they were in the marriage, there's no comparison. And I don't think, you know, I, I don't think that the, I think that the 97.3 is only important insofar as, ironically, the distribution pretty much matches the proportionate distribution of the assets when they came into the marriage. There's not a whole lot of difference, except the fact that Pat has literally less than half of what she had when she came in, and she has an income of $2,100 a month from now on versus $4,300 a month. Um, mental health. Um, I would, you, you asked about the issue of mental health. I would again point to the record and say, Pat testified about, literally, she said once they moved to Beverly Hills, if she got out of bed and took her shower, she was done for the day. Mr. Mapes testified that he couldn't even remember that. He couldn't even remember that. So, and, and I would point out that she commented several times that she loved him, she trusted him, and he never once used even the slightest term of endearment or affection. So when the court started taking this testimony and reviewing the testimony he heard, you know, what, they, what, what Mr. Mace really doesn't like is how the court viewed the evidence and the, and the testimony that it heard. And on balance, it said, I think she should be able to keep what she's got left here. It's not that much. Um, special equities. Um, he uh, was briefly touched on. We did do away with special equities. In Robertson versus Robertson, um, the Supreme Court said, though, and I would point out, that that's premised on a theory of equal partnership. And I think if you look at any of these factors, enormous disparity of contributions, the windfall, just imagine the windfall he's asking for, the economic circumstances, the length of the marriage. This wasn't a partnership. I mean, within two years, this lady went from a, a tranquil, pleasant life living on the water on Treasure Island to a house in Fort Myers and another house for sale that they couldn't even get rid of without selling it at a loss. And um, I don't think that constitutes an, uh, 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 I don't think that constitutes a partnership marriage. Um, for sure, she testified that he, you know, pushed her. She also made an interesting comment in the trial transcript when she was, when she was asked. She said he was cunning, you know, he was cunning about the way he did things. Um, it briefly touched on. Um, uh, she did testify that she was going to give him a life estate, but we have to separate here one property versus another. When she discovered that the Beverly Hills property was titled jointly, she went ahead with it because she intended to create a trust. And when she was asked how that trust would be set up, what she said was, I wanted to make sure that he could stay in the house for as long as he lived if I passed first. So she didn't use the phrase life estate, but that is clearly what she had in mind. 
It was the second house when she said, after having been hoodwinked the first time, she said when they purchased the second house in Fort Myers, well, I think I want that in my own name. And he said, well, that's fine, but I want seventy-five dollars to $100,000. That was her testimony before the trial court. She said, well, I wasn't going to give him any more money. Um, uh, let me think what else I really, I would say this court has said in multiple cases, figure be figure, um, Roth be Roth, um, and in fact has, has on numerous occasions cited McMonagle that, that an inequitable distribution, if it is justified, is reasonable. Um, I went over the contributions of each, to each spouse. Um, I would remind this court that none of this testimony was controverted. I mean, there was no testimony that, the, regardless of how the money traveled around, there was never any dispute that it was always her money. I would ask the court to affirm the decision of the trial judge. He was an experienced trial judge. I think the second argument that, you know, that this gave the appearance of just a mindless entry of an order is, 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 is without merit. I would ask this court to affirm the, the ju and let this lady get on with her life. Mr. Franklin? Very, very briefly. I submit we wouldn't be here if the real estate market had gone up and she was able to have made a lot of money. Um, we're here because the real estate market changed and that was a factor and it's pretty obvious from both briefs. More importantly, uh, I should have read and I now for sure want to read the last sentence where Rodriguez, the third district, uh, discussed this issue. Past financial indiscretions of the parties and the significant debt they incurred during the marriage cannot now serve as a means to castigate the husband, citing to Rosenfeld. So even if Judge Wallace, the rest of uh, the court, doesn't think that my client was a stand-up citizen, or, and maybe he was a little uh, tricky and he pushed, and whatever other words of uh, descriptive art were used, it doesn't rise to the level of being so grossly, disproportionately shortchanged to end up with 3% uh, of the marital assets when property is in joint names. The McDonald case. You're down to uh, 20 seconds. So okay. I'll that, give you 30 to wind up, though. I, I'll wind it up fast. I'm not going to abuse that. Uh, that McDonald case, or however you pronounce it, was decided before the statutory change that made it so important for public policy and legal reasons that you not only start, but you end in almost every instance with an equal division. So here, uh, when counsel was up at the podium and talking about all of the facts, she missed the law. The law wasn't part of the oral argument and it's not in the brief. There is nothing in this final judgment that talks about marital assets versus non-marital and shifting the burden. And, let's, and let's the fact that it's clear and convincing the last evidence. Word. So thank you, Your Honor, and we hope that uh, the final judgment is reversed. All right. Counsel, both of you, please have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can. You sure? Yeah, I'm good. You good? Okay, we're going to keep going. Uh, we